Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for taking your taking time out of your day to talk about this um, subject, which I'm sure all of you are very worried about, as am I, uh, post COVID and all of these animals that have been adopted over this last uh, year of the pandemic. So uh, we're mostly going to be talking about dogs here, but I'm also going to throw in a little bit about cats because yes, cats do get separation anxiety. So let's see if my, there we go, my slides will advance. So obviously in light of COVID-19 is kind of why we're all here. Um, many of these animals uh, were adopted during this period of time and really didn't uh, learn that their owners leave them at all. Most of the owners here in the DC, uh, Northern Virginia area have been taking their dogs everywhere. It's quite dog friendly here. Um, and so really the dogs have never even been left home alone whatsoever and come I think everyone's kind of rolling out, um, you know, some sort of back to work program for like after Labor Day. So I'm a little bit worried um, about what's going to happen. So what we're going to talk about today is overt separation anxiety, the cases of mistaken separation anxiety, covert separation anxiety, how we diagnose uh, separation anxiety, what are some sort of comorbid diagnoses that may be confused with um, separation anxiety as well. So hyperattachment and confinement anxiety comorbid diagnoses that we commonly see with separation anxiety and how do we treat separation anxiety. So, so let's talk about overt separation anxiety. This is the obvious. Um, when the owner comes home, the house is completely destroyed. The dogs have pooped or peed. Um, and so they're going to come to your clinic saying these presenting complaints. So what are we going to see when left home alone, the dog is going to be urinating, defecating, destroying the household and potentially vocalizing. So some, um, you know, a lot of our owners here in this area live in condos or apartments and they may get complaints from their neighbors that the dog is vocalizing all the time. They can also see an exuberant greeting upon the owner return. So the dog acts like, oh my God, where have you been all my life? Um, and sometimes we see a very Velcro dog, meaning one that is kind of attached to the owner at the hip and follows it from room to room, gets up with it from, you know, if you get up off the couch and go to get a drink of water, it gets up with you and goes with you, that kind of thing. So this is little Charlie Champion. He is one of my favorite cases from my residency. Um, he's a little eight pound dachshund mix that um, was the classic case of uh, overt separation anxiety. So let's kind of take a look uh, at the day in the life of Charlie Champion. And you can see the picture on the right is his kennel. This is actually a large uh, dog kennel. So very, very heavy gauge wire. And you can see on this particular day, Charlie, um, chewed the wires up, bent them back, and was able to escape. Now what Tar Charlie typically did to escape was actually he would jump on the edge of the crate, it would knock over, the crate pan would fall on top of him, he would crawl out from under it, and then as most of you are, you know, are aware, the bottom of a crate, the openings are much bigger, and so then he would crawl out the bottom openings, um, which were now essentially on the side. Um, but on this particular day, the owners decided, well, we're going to just block him in. So they used a wall and a couch to make sure that he couldn't actually knock that crate over. So Charlie took matters into his own hands. And this is what he did on that particular day. So this picture up in the upper left is a picture frame. Um, what you don't see is all the shards of glass that also broke um, with the frame. This is a, you know, a charger for a phone. We can see the carpet padding underneath the carpet that led into the kitchen. Um, this is a bathroom towel plus some, you know, books and papers that he got off of this table here in the bottom middle, um, where he destroyed some library books of one of the owners um, who was studying for his, or preparing, I guess, for his thesis, and many of those textbooks were destroyed. And then this is a speaker, very, very heavy stereo speaker that um, Charlie must have jumped up on or, or knocked over in some fashion. So that was one day in the life of little Charlie. But then there are cases of mistaken separation anxiety. So you can see the destruction here in this picture. Um, and they may have the same presenting complaints. They come in to see you because, oh, the dog is urinating or defecating when they're gone. There's destruction in the house, like that, uh, that phone book. There's vocalization um, that the, the neighbors are complaining about. They may have that same exuberant greeting upon owner return. And they may also be a Velcro dog. 
but we have differential diagnoses for these um, for these presenting complaints. So urination may actually be incomplete house training, other phobias like noise phobias or storm phobias, medical obviously with like urinary tract infections, the dog can't hold it, or maybe it's PUPD and so obviously needs to go more frequently. Defecation, same thing. It could be incomplete house training, other noise phobias, um, storm phobias, medical. Certainly parasitism can cause an increase in urgency um, to go to the bathroom. So destruction could be a lack of environmental enrichment, meaning the dog isn't destroying because it's panicked. It just needs something to do. A vocalization could be other noise phobias, but it could also be medical. So if the dog is painful, it could be, you know, howling or crying and the neighbors notice that. That exuberant greeting upon owner return and a Velcro dog could just be hyperattachment hyper syndrome, which we'll talk about in a second. And owners will often say, oh, but he looks guilty when I return home. So, um, you know, th they know they did wrong or, you know, they're doing it on purpose. They're, they're angry that I'm leaving. And so, you know, look at this dog, how guilty he looks. But what this look is, is not actually guilt because we don't think the dogs actually can feel any sort of guilt. They're pretty amoral. Um, it's actually just appeasement. And so what he's doing is he is, this dog is saying, I know you're angry. I'm not really sure why, but let me sort of show you the most vulnerable side of me and, re and realize that I'm not angry back at you, essentially. So, so the appeasement gestures, this is actually called the ladder of aggression. And you can see um, this graphic comes from the BSAVA uh, Canine and Feline Behavioral Manual. And so the green, yellow, and orange signals are things that a dog would do, those nonverbal signals to say, I'm not sure why you're so upset, but I don't mean you any harm. So they may, you know, pin those ears back. They'll give you the whale eye, turn their head away. They lean away from you. They may creep away, walk away from you, stand crouched with their tail tucked under. And if you continue to be angry at them and they still don't understand why, that could actually cause escalation. So it actually could cause aggression. So remember, it's not guilt. It's just appeasement. So let's go back to the case of mistaken separation anxiety. This case presented to me also when I was in um, residency, and this was an eight month old um, Roddy mix, also named Charlie aptly. Um, and on this particular day, this picture was um, the phone book. So you can tell how old this, um, this case is because who gets phone books nowadays anyway. Um, but basically the owner presented to me for separation anxiety had been referred from their primary care veterinarian. And um, I said, well, you know, things have just aren't really fitting with separation anxiety. There's some other things that I'm a little bit more concerned about. So I had the owners go home and video him to find out exactly what he did during the day when they were gone. And what we found on video was Charlie would kind of wait at the window and watch the owners um, back out of the driveway. And then he would go and, you know, get a drink of water and grab some bites of food and then go lay on the couch. And the next three to four hours of video were incredibly boring. He basically just, you know, tossed and turned and um, he did bark at the mailman at one point in time or UPS driver or something like that, but went right back to sleep. And then around midday, Charlie got up, he stretched, he went to go get another drink of water and um, a bite of food. And he found a tissue box lying on this very same um, coffee table here. And what he did was he destroyed the tissue box and the tissues were flying everywhere. He was having himself a grand old time. And once he had completely destroyed the box, then he went over, got up on the couch and slept for another three hours until the owner came home. So had I been treating this dog for separation anxiety with medication, I would have been incredibly inappropriate because this dog really just lacked environmental stimulation. So we were able to give some more environmental enrichment during the day, including feeder toys, um, frozen Kongs, that kind of thing. The owner hired a dog walker to come midday and Charlie was perfectly fine after that. So let's talk about covert separation anxiety. So covert is kind of more of an insidious disease process where the owners aren't really sure what's going on because they're not witnessing the obvious destruction, poop or pee. So some complaints that um, might be happening, the dog isn't eating when they're home alone. We do know that anxiety suppresses appetite. So if um, my patients, oftentimes the owners will describe, oh, they don't eat breakfast. 
And then, you know, once everyone comes home um, at dinner time, they will finally then eat. Well, that's probably because they're too anxious and worried about that departure. Um, they may have excessive thirst upon the owner return. That's because they may be panting and pacing all day long. They may destroy their bedding. Um, and this would be beyond the age when destruction is normal. So one question that I always ask owners is if the dog is crated, do you provide anything in there like a bed? And oftentimes they'll be like, oh no, he destroys every bed. Well, that's not normal. Dogs don't wanna destroy the softest, most comfortable thing unless they're panicked. Um, and so if they are still destroying bedding, possible that we have some separation anxiety going on. Um, we do have some dogs that attempt to block their owner's departure. So they will actually get in between the owner and the door. In fact, to the point of causing um, severe aggression. So I have a case that, um, Kind of stands out in my mind. It's a fellow veterinarian um, here in the Nova area, and she came to me because the dog had severe aggression towards her and her spouse when they would try to leave. He would actually attack them to the point of causing really deep puncture wounds. And once we got video on him, he had separation anxiety during the day. So once we got the separation anxiety under control, he no longer had the aggression towards the owners. The other thing that we can see is other behavioral disorders worsening on days of departures. And that's the concept of trigger stacking, which I will explain here. So basically every behavior has a threshold. So above the threshold, we see the behavior and below we don't. So anything can cause an animal or a person to trigger stack. That could be, we can trigger stack throughout the week. So Monday departures are okay. Tuesdays are okay. Wednesdays are okay. Thursdays are okay. Friday, I'm getting close to that threshold. And then lo and behold, my parents try and have a dinner party on Friday night, but I've got pretty severe stranger danger that is even worse because I have been stacked throughout the week. So had they hold, held that dinner party on Monday, maybe we just got a couple growls or barks, um, but then the dog retreated. But on Friday night, we can't handle it because that dog is trigger stacked. We can also trigger stack our disorders in general. So if the dog has separation anxiety, and then it also has a fear of strangers and the superintendent had to come in the, build, come in the apartment and fix the dishwasher or something like that. So now the dog is crated, there's a stranger in the apartment. There's also noise phobia and there was a lot of noise going on as the super was um, you know, pounding and hammering and drilling, maybe some construction down the street that they heard. But the dog has also been limping since it went to the dog park last Saturday and the owner hasn't had a chance to take it in um, to see you. And so it's a little bit painful as well. And then the owner decides when they come home from work, then they're gonna actually go out to dinner afterwards. And so now they have this second departure that's trigger stacking them and we have a thunderstorm while the owner is gone. Well, that thunderstorm is what caused the dog to go over threshold and now we see the destruction. So this could be a covert separation anxiety that then becomes overt because of that trigger stacking factor. It could just be co um, overt separation anxiety that becomes even worse um, in the presence of the thunderstorm phobia. So, and then we get that destruction. So let's talk about Lincoln. Lincoln is one of my favorite um, trigger stacking separation anxiety cases. He's kind of the quintessential um, trigger stacker through the week. So on Monday, his dad's depart and he does well. On Tuesday, kind of does okay. A little bit more panting, pacing, but not terrible. He can settle after about half an hour or so. On Wednesday, he needs a low dose of a pre-departure medication. And we'll talk about pre-departure medications in a second. On Thursday, he needs mid-range of his pre-departure medications. On Friday, he needs high dose of his pre-departure medications. And a, a trying to do a weekend departure, forget it. He is too trigger stacked. We have not been able to find a medication protocol that actually works for them to be able to do a weekend departure. So the owners know this. And so they do, they plan, um, you know, stuff to do with friends on Mondays or Tuesdays, because he does do much better with that. Um, they may uh, sort of conglomerate all their errands and one runs errands while the other stays home with Lincoln, just kind of depends on how they want to manage that, but they do have to manage it pretty heavily. 
So what about cats? Cats absolutely do get um, separation anxiety. Most often we see urination outside of the litter box when the owner is gone. So the cat may use, the, the cat is using the litter box when the owner is home or the owner is not traveling, but when the owner is gone, it's actually urinating They're, um, outside of the box. There could be defecation outside the litter box. There could be destruction, increase, um, you know, they're, they're worried. So they're scratching on things that they shouldn't as a stress reliever, but also we could see vocalization. Again, it is incredibly rare, but it does happen. And I do believe that we are going to be seeing more cases of cat separation anxiety as well. I know my daughter um, who has been doing virtual school basically spends all day in her room, all day and night in her room with her cat. And so I'm a little worried about our own cat once she goes back to school um, in person in the fall. So, so how do we diagnose separation anxiety? So obviously you have been presented with this complaint from the owner. The first thing that we wanna do is make sure we rule out any sort of medical contribution. So making sure that this isn't a case case of mistaken separation anxiety. So doing a CBC, chemistry, and a urinalysis. And then we also want to screen for those other behavioral disorders because while the owner may be coming to you for what they think is separation anxiety, it's actually really truly that thunderstorm phobia. And the dog doesn't have any sort of signs of anxiety on days where it doesn't storm. And so treating for separation anxiety in and of itself would be inappropriate. We really need to address the thunderstorm phobia instead. So definitive diagnosis is based off video. So this day and age, everybody has some way, some device that they can get a video of their pet, whether it be they just set up their phone and leave it um, recording, they FaceTime with the pet, um, you know, Zoom meetings, there's so many options. Most of my owners nowadays have some sort of fun, you know, Furbo or Pabo, uh, you know, camera. Um, so they're probably already watching, um, but if not, there are lots of different options. So what we recommend is doing a video for a routine departure. Routine departures would be like your Monday through Friday, I'm going to work. It's normal. A non-routine departure. So I come home from work and then I go back out to go to dinner. We want to video as the week goes on because again, because of that trigger stacking, what we see on Monday may not be what we get on Friday. We want to do a departure when it storms because thunderstorm phobia and um, separation anxiety do go hand in hand. And we'll talk about that in the comorbid diagnoses. So again, lots of different options, nanny cams, security cams, they can FaceTime or Skype. They can use an old school video camera, an old phone or a laptop or computer to record, but some way, shape or form, they have the capability to get that video. So let's talk about another case of mistaken identity um, and a case of cat separation anxiety. So I had a, cat, a case one time, owner came in with her um, young dog and we were uh, discussing its fear-based aggression. And she was saying some things that kind of made me think, I wonder if this dog also has some separation anxiety. So the, the dog wouldn't eat breakfast. Um, he would often get very nervous if the owners were packing suitcases to go away those types of things. And I said, you know what, let's pop a video camera on him. Just make sure that we're not missing something as far as his behavioral diagnosis is concerned. Um, and the next time she contacted me with the video results, what we found out from that video is that her cat actually had separation anxiety, not the dog. So he actually, the cat meowed for almost a full eight hours while the owner was gone um, at work. And the dog was fine. The dog was completely passed out on the couch. No no, no big deal, didn't really care that the cat was meowing, but um, the cat then became a patient of mine as well. I have had cases as well where the owners have a multi-dog household. They assume it is one dog that has the separation anxiety. And when we video, lo and behold, it's actually the other dog or it's actually both of the dogs. So we would be treating the wrong patient potentially um, without that video. All right, so let's talk about hyperattachment. So hyperattachment um, essentially is that Velcro dog. And these dogs can have hyperattachment with or without separation anxiety. So they are two completely separate diagnoses. You can have separation anxiety without hyperattachment and you can have hyperattachment without separation anxiety. 
or you can have both. Um, and if we don't have separation anxiety, the goal of treating hyperattachment is really just focused on giving the dog uh, independence. So teaching the dog that it doesn't need to follow you from room to room, um, those types of things. And really very rarely is medication even needed in these cases. Then there's confinement anxiety. So confinement anxiety is, you know, destruction or um, all of these signs, pooping, peeing, when we are confined. And this can be with or without separation anxiety as well. So without separation anxiety, the treatment is actually to be loose in the home for departures. But owners are not going to let you let that dog loose in the home um, without video. So they need to be able to um, confirm that the dog isn't going to destroy their whole house like they've been destroying their bed um, and pooping and peeing. And some dogs, that's all that we need is actually to just let them out of confinement. Now, that being said, because changing from being confined to not confined is a big change for a dog, um, I would continue to monitor over several months. So some dogs take two to three months to kind of settle into a new routine. And so if they then develop separation anxiety over that two to three months, it, this destruction will recur. So we need to intervene sooner rather than later, which is where video monitoring is gonna be very key. So talking about comorbidities, so when it comes to separation anxiety, there are two studies, um, one by Dr. Overall and one by Michelle Bamberger, looking at um, comorbid diagnoses. And what both of these studies found is that dogs with separation anxiety also had a higher likelihood of having thunderstorm phobia and noise phobia and vice versa. Those dogs that had thunderstorm phobia and noise phobia also had a higher likelihood of having separation anxiety. So where this plays a role is obviously with that trigger stacking, but also if the owners are coming to you for say cilio because um, their dog has horrible noise phobia, thunderstorm phobia, and you know, 4th of July fireworks are coming up. So they need a little bit of cilio gel we would absolutely recommend that that patient um, be video monitored to see does it also have separation anxiety. And I would say clinically, um, anecdotally, I have sort of a triad of diagnoses that often go hand in hand and that's um, separation anxiety, thunderstorm phobia, and car ride anxiety. Those three things do tend to go hand in hand in my patients. So things to look out for. But then also pain actually can increase noise phobia. And since we know noise phobia can go hand in hand with separation anxiety, it leads us to believe that pain possibly can increase separation anxiety. And again, because of that trigger stacking phenomenon. So this was a study by Danny Mills, one of our colleagues over in the UK and his group, looking at dogs, clinical cases of dogs with pain and uh, cases without. And what they found in the dogs with pain had a higher likelihood of having noise phobias than the dogs um, presenting without pain as, um, as a presenting complaint. And the dogs with pain had a later onset of noise phobias than those dogs in the, that had noise phobias in the without pain group. So typically noise phobias, unless there's like a true traumatic event, like a firework goes off right next to them or gunshot, something like that, um, without that, most of our noise phobias tend to um, have an age of onset around age two, which is behavioral maturity. Um, it, we can see it definitely younger than that, but most often it's around age two. Whereas the dogs with pain, their age of onset was about age seven. So much later, which means that the pain was probably trigger stacking them. And had they not had pain, they probably wouldn't have developed noise phobias. So definitely something that we need to um, make sure that we're ruling out pain as a contribution if an owner presents to you with a sudden onset of noise phobia um, at a later age. So also, again, pain can increase separation anxiety with that trigger stacking phenomenon. And this is a case of that. This is Gimlet. She was a six-year-old um, female spade pug who presented to me um, with separation anxiety. However, she had had previously well-controlled separation anxiety. So um, the owner had worked with a certified separation anxiety trainer, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and the owner was able to leave for six hours with absolutely no medication on board um, for Gimlet. And all of a sudden she developed a cyst in between her toes and the owners could not leave her for even 45 seconds at a time. So they were not able to leave this dog at all at this point. And so, 
she presented to me because the trainer was like, I'm not really sure what's going on. That's when I discovered the cyst in between her toes. The owners hadn't noticed it either. Um, we implemented appropriate pain management and um, some topical and oral therapy for the cyst. We did not need to do any sort of surgery. So it might've been like a, you know, grass on or something that, that worked its way out already, but we were able to actually then return those departures to about one to two hours with absolutely no signs of stress and with no further training or medication, which was fantastic. All right, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of how we treat um, our separation anxiety uh, cases. And I will say every case is kind of different in terms of where they end up with treatment, how many of these things um, we need to do or how many of they that they need um, depends on the case and the severity and obviously their response too. So we have our pulsed electromagnetic field. Um, there are some wearables out there. There's pheromones, nutraceuticals, probiotics, medication, and training. So let's talk about the Calmer Canine, and obviously a CC um, is sponsoring our talk today. So they are the makers of the Calmer Canine, which is pulsed electric, targeted pulsed electromagnetic field. Um, and much like the loop for pain, this is actually targeting um, that that pulsed electromagnetic field is actually targeting the amygdala, so which is the emotional center of our brain. It is a different pulsed um, electromagnetic field. So you can't just use the, the pain control as CC loop for, um, for the separation anxiety, but it's a similar concept. Basically the device emits these signals. Um, the signals actually increase production of nitrous oxide and nitrous oxide inhibits our pro-inflammatory cytokines and increases our anti-inflammatory cytokines, but it also induces production of endorphins, serotonin, and dopamine, which all of our neurotransmitters are what our product Products and medication are targeting. And the net effect is reduction in neuroinflammation and rebalancing of the overactive anxious brain. And several of my colleagues, um, or two of my colleagues down in uh, North Carolina did do some, uh, do a study on uh, this uh, use for separation anxiety. And what we did, or what they did was uh, two 15 minute sessions per day, so you can use it as a handheld device. So you can just hold it over the dog in the appropriate area, or you can use the convenience vest, which it actually sort of snaps into. Um, the treatments are done when the owner is home. So it's not like you put the device on and then leave the dog. You actually do the treatments twice a day around um, every 12 hours. And then we um, have the departures like normal. Um, the, they did four to six weeks was considered one treatment course. And for some cases, there may be longer or subsequent treatment courses needed, depending on um, how they respond. So, but they did find significant effect with using um, the Calmer Canine. So it's super cool, especially for owners that don't necessarily want to go the medication route. Um, here in DC, I find that almost all the owners are on medications themselves. So they are open to medications. But when I did my residency in St. Louis, um, people really were very medication avoidant. And so um, it's one more tool in our arsenal of natural type products, which is fantastic. We also have those wearables. So like the Thunder shirt, the anxiety wrap or the storm defender wrap. The concept is kind of like swaddling a baby if the dog feels best when it's like tight and um, you know, sort of having that snug effect of the of the wrap, then it can definitely help. Now I use these with caution only because if the dog is destructive, he may actually try and destroy the, the shirt. So we definitely wanna make sure that we're monitoring on video. Um, and this is oftentimes very useful in the beginning, but may actually lose um, effect over time when it comes to separation anxiety because they're in it for a lot. And so they, they will basically just desensitize to that sensation of having that wrap on. Then we have our pheromone products. So Adaptal, this is the maternal appeasing pheromone that dogs, um, mother dogs produce when they're nursing their puppies. So it has kind of a calming relaxation property to it. It's available in a collar. So it looks like that old fashioned flea collar warms up with their body heat and emits the pheromone. There's also a spray so they can spray down the wearable, they can spray a bandana, they can spray the inside of the crate or the dog's bed where it tends to um, lie. And that also has comes as the diffuse so you can plug in the diffuser in their confinement room or where they typically hang out like the living room. 
Some of our natural type products, nutraceuticals on the market that we have, the first one um, from Verbac, which is uh, Inxetane. And what this is is an L-theanine supplement. So L-theanine is an amino acid found in green tea. A lot of people drink green tea for its anti-anxiety properties. And the reason is it increases serotonin, our coping neurotransmitter, as well as a little bit of dopamine, which is our pleasure neurotransmitter, as well as GABA, which is our inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it's a very palatable um, natural option. It's given twice a day, incredible safety. Um, in fact, they stopped the LD50 trials at um, 500 times the dosage because they had no deaths. Um, so it's incredibly safe, very, very palatable. In fact, we also use this oftentimes in cats and cats most often will take it like a treat as well. So um, again, twice a day, um, but you can also do double the dose on days of departures. You can do double the dose on days of thunderstorms, that type of thing. So then we have Zilkine, which is um, alpha -cazo so alpha cazozapine is a protein found in cow's milk. So if you've ever heard of the saying of drink a warm glass of milk before you go to bed, the reason is alpha is because of alpha cazozapine. It binds to the same receptors in our brains that Xanax and Valium do. So it binds to that benzodiazepine receptor. So um, it can have a really nice anti-panic effect. Um, this is a once daily, uh, labeled for once daily administration, but incredibly safe as well. In fact, I will use upwards of four times the dose if, um, if needed. It's labeled for once a day, but oftentimes I will do it um, BID. Now I wanna just point out, um, you'll see on the, the picture here, and the reason I point this out is because I didn't know when I first started using it and I was not doing the correct thing, but you'll see the picture shows the capsule being broken open and that powder coming out. And that's actually very important. You can't just give this capsule whole. You wanna make sure that you actually break that capsule open and sprinkle the powder into a little dollop of canned food or sprinkle it over um, their dry food. And it is very palatable, supposedly tastes like powdered milk. Um, so most cats and dogs will gobble it right up. Then there's Calming Care, which is kind of the newest um, nutraceutical supplement on the, on the behavior market. So this is by Purina. And so many, most of us are familiar with like Fortiflora being their um, sort of standard probiotic. This is actually a very different bacteria. It's Bifidobacterium longum, which has been shown um, in many studies in rodents to help with anxiety as well as humans. Um, and now we have a dog study as well. And I am, uh, it's my understanding from the company that uh, uh, Calming Care for Cats will be out this summer. Um, it is the same bacteria for cats. It's just a smaller volume. So right now when I'm using it in kitty cats, I actually just use a half a packet once a day. Um, and so for dogs, it's one packet once a day, no matter the size. And for cats, it's a half a packet, but hopefully we'll have that, um, that kitty cat version out here very soon. But then we have our medications and these are kind of the staples for most of um, my patients due to the severity of their disease process. Um, we have two FDA approved medications for separation anxiety. The first is Clomacalm and the picture is old. It's now since been bought by Verbac um, is gonna be the, the uh, manufacturer of Clomacalm. It's a tricyclic antidepressant. Um, so oftentimes used for dogs that um, have symptoms like pooping and peeing because also it has anticholinergic effects as well. So it can help with the dogs that are, you know, pooping, peeing, or drooling profusely. We'll kind of take that side effect profile with the anticholinergic effects of our tricyclic antidepressants. It is once daily administration um, labeled for once daily dosing. However, I will say most veterinary behaviorists use it as a twice daily dose. So while it says on the bottle two to four mgs per kg total daily dosage, we actually, most of us will divide it into one to two mgs per kg twice a day. And just find that the half-life is way too short um, to, to get away with just the, every 24 hour dosing. Then we also have Reconcile, which is the dog brand of fluoxetine. So again, this is FDA approved for dogs with separation anxiety. It's manufactured by PRN. And I will say that I, now that we have Reconcile um, back on the market, it was on the market when I was in my residency and that's what we used exclusively. Um, went off the market because 
you know, that's what pharmaceutical companies like to do to us clinicians is take stuff on and off. Um, so it was off the market for a while, which means we had to only use the generic human version of fluoxetine and now it is back on the market. And this is what I use exclusively. I do not prescribe generic fluoxetine because I find much better efficacy with the brand. Um, this, is, this is sort of true in um, all of our veterinary behavior sort of world, um, but also in human psychiatry. Psychiatrists will, will report that brand is everything because really brand has to prove efficacy, not just that they have the active ingredient in the formulation. The other really nice thing about um, Reconcile is its pal palatability. So it is like a pork flavored chew. So most dogs will take it like a treat. It is hydrolyzed. So if they have, um, you know, food allergies and you have to be worried about that, it's going to be hydrolyzed as is the calming care, which I did not um, uh, explain when I was talking about that. So, so if we have those pets that often have multiple things going on, uh, we can be cautious in that. So this is a once daily administration. Fluoxetine has a very, very long half-life in the dog. And so um, we recommend doing one to two mg per kg once a day. With both of these medications, I am always going to start on the low end of uh, the dose range. So anywhere from about a half a mg per kg to one mg per kg as my starting dose. Um, again, with Clomacalm, that would be BID and with Reconcile, that would be um, once a day. And the reason being is because of the side effects. So if you, you know, say you have this dog like little Charlie Champion and you go, whoa, my God, this dog is awful. He's panicked. He obviously needs to go straight to the two mg per kg of the reconcile. Um, you would absolutely see side effects with that. So biggest side effects um, with reconcile do tend to be gastrointestinal, vomiting, loose stool, and appetite suppression. Um, with Clomacalm, it does tend to be um, GI as well, but you can also see those anticholinergic um, effects. So dry mouth, dry eye, um, urinary and fecal retention. So they're not pooping or peeing as frequently. So, so you want to make sure that you always start low and work your way up if you need to. The other thing is some dogs tend to respond really favorably to the low dose. So sometimes I am pleasantly surprised that um, just the smallest half a mg per kg to one mg per kg actually can work for some of these patients. We don't even need to go up to that higher dosage. So, but we start low and then every four weeks we do make the determination, do we need to go up? And what we're looking for is gonna be based off that video of what are the owners seeing when um, the dog is home alone. But then we also have our pre-departure medication options. So um, again, with our, our daily medications like our tricyclics and our SSRIs, it can take up to four weeks to see full effect, but also it may take a couple dose changes um, over the time. And so in the meantime, while the owner's um, you know, house is being destroyed and um, you know, there's poop and pee everywhere, they need, as well as the dog, but they need immediate relief. And that's where pre-departure medications um, can play a role. So there are lots of different options options. Most often I do use trazodone as my first line of defense um, and the dose range is five to 10 mg per kg every um, two hours prior to a departure and then it can be repeated every eight to 12 hours. Now when you are combining trazodone with another serotonergic medication, meaning a medication that increases serotonin like our SSRIs or our tricyclics, you can get the potential for serotonin syndrome. So serotonin syndrome is essentially an overdose of serotonin, um, but it's a very individual sensitivity and it doesn't mean that you only get it when you max out your trazodone dose in addition to maxing out, say, your reconciled dose. I have seen dogs get um, serotonin syndrome on sub-therapeutic levels of fluoxetine alone. So I had a dog at 0.75 mg per kg um, started on fluoxetine and got serotonin syndrome. Um, I have had dogs be on max dose fluoxetine, max dose trazodone, and then they go into the ER and get tramadol for, for limping, um, and which is also a serotonergic medication and have no problems whatsoever. So it does depend, seem to be a very individual sensitivity to that syndrome, but it's something that I warn owners about um, every time that I'm um, using any sort of serotonergic medication. 
Now, if the trazodone is not enough, again, we're gonna base this off of video. So what are we seeing on the video? Are we seeing less intense um, reaction? Or is the dog able to actually recover and maybe only after a half an hour of panic, it now can relax for the rest of the day. So if the trazodone is helping, but just not enough, I am then going to layer something in. If the dog has side effects with trazodone or zero effect whatsoever, then I will scrap it and move on to the next drug in my list. So my next go-to does tend to be clonidine. And this, this may be different than, um, you know, if you've listened to another veterinary behaviorist uh, lecture, they may go to gabapentin next, but my, my favorite is clonidine. So clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist. So it's gonna really target your norepinephrine um, so the dose range, if you look in plums, it's 0.01 to 0.05. Most of the time I'm not doing that low dose. Um, I may do a low dose to start to have the owners see if there's side effects, um, but most often we need that mid to high dose. And again, it's going to be given two hours prior, and then you can redose that every six to eight hours. So again, if no side effects, um, but not enough effect, I'm going to layer in something else. If there have been side effects or there's zero effect whatsoever with the clonidine, I'm gonna scrap it and move on to my next um, medication, which is gabapentin. And you'll notice the doses is the dose is much higher than the pain control dose. Um, so behaviorists, we typically use 20 to 40 mg per keg about two hours um, in advance. And then you can redose that every eight to 12 hours as needed. Um, and some of us, um, myself included, do go up to about 50 mg per keg um, if we need to. So the safety on gabapentin is um, enormous. And hopefully there, are, I think there's a resident that's publishing a study about um, 50 mg per keg gabapentin here soon. So, so hopefully we'll see that. But then we also have our benzodiazepines. So um, our benzodiazepines like Xanax and Valium, obviously. Um, lorazepam is my favorite. Uh, you talk to seven vet behaviorists, they're probably going to pick seven different benzos um, as their sort of first line of defense. I used to use a lot of alprazolam, um, but I had a rash of paradoxical react, paradoxical excitation reactions with it. And I was like, I'm done with alprazolam. I'm moving on. And um, then lorazepam and I became good friends. So I have very few um, paradoxical excitation um, and it does seem to be the most efficacious, at least in my hands. So, and the dose is 0.01 to 0.01. Um, mix per keg. Now it would not be wrong in some cases to do like a benzo as our first pre-departure medication. It is a true anti-panic medication. The reason that I don't necessarily reach for it first is twofold. Number one, um, most of my patients do not just have separation anxiety. They also come to me with many other diagnoses to include aggression. And of the medications that could cause disinhibition of aggression it is going to be the benzodiazepines. So we could actually worsen aggression by using a benzo. But the other reason that I don't necessarily reach for a benzo um, first and foremost is because it um, can block memory, long-term memory consolidation. And so when I am doing training as a part of our, um, our treatment protocol, it actually may impair the learning factor um, it's going to reduce the panic, but the dog isn't actually going to learn over the course of time. And so I don't necessarily go to a benzo first and foremost. Um, many clinicians do though. So, but then we also have propranolol. So propranolol being a beta, um, beta blocker can block the physiologic panic response. And it's the same um, dosage that you would use for um, cardiac effects. And again, some dogs may be on all five of these medications. So all of the above. Um, now let's move on to training. So I mentioned that training is um, absolutely a part of our treatment protocol. It is not medication or products without any sort of behavior modification. So this is actually um, a graphic from the BOND program. So BOND stands for Be Positive, Only Reward Calm Behavior, No More Drama, and Develop Your Dog's Independence. It's actually a program that my mentor, Debbie Horwitz, developed in conjunction with the then makers of Reconcile but um, is now available through um, PRN as well. 
And owners can actually go to um, Reconcile's website and learn more about the bond program and how they go about the training process. So being positive means focusing on positive behaviors that are critical to success using only positive reinforcement training, um, encouraging and not reprimanding, um, um, encouraging good behavior and not reprimanding undesired behaviors, re remembering that your dog is not a bad dog. Um, so I have a colleague who likes to say the dog is having a hard time, it's not giving you a hard time. Um, you want to only reward calm behavior, so ignoring attention-seeking behavior, especially when your dog is overly excited, um, because if you get excited, your dog may also. Um, so, you know, when the dog is um, really hyped up and then we actually interact with it, you're just encouraging that behavior in the future. That also plays into the no more drama. So if you get super like worried, like, I'm so sorry, Fifi, I'm leaving, and you make a huge deal of it, your dog could also think this is a huge deal that mom is leaving. So uh, we definitely want to make sure that we basically ignore the dog um, when we are coming and going and basically get your, uh, making sure that you are as calm as possible um, when you leave. And then when you come home and the dog is super over exuberant, not actually interacting with it until um, it has calmed down as well. Also, this is leads into what we call uncoupling departure cues, which I will talk about in a second, um, and then developing your dog's independence. So making sure that they have a safe space to be calm, um, that we teach them to actually stay there for increased periods of time um, in order to increase that sort of hyper attachment piece, um, if that is a component. So as far as further training is concerned, there are additional sort of steps um, that we recommend doing. So the, I mentioned the uncoupling departure cues. So this means the cues that tell your dog, oh no, mom is leaving, okay? So for me, it is putting makeup on because I don't put makeup on otherwise if I'm not leaving the house. Although this past year, since I don't really leave the house, um, I definitely put makeup on for webinars and such. Um, so that's actually helped my own dogs. Um, but it could be my mom used to um, put hairspray on her hair and that indicated to her dog that she was about to leave. Could be um, putting your shoes on, grabbing your keys, grabbing your briefcase, whatever the case may be. We identify what those cues are and then work on uncoupling them, meaning we work on making, making those not mean anything to the dog. So you grab your keys, you put on your shoes, and then you go sit down and watch TV for 30, 40 minutes. So basically the dog isn't trigger stacked by the time that you leave the house. They're way down here at baseline because those cues don't actually cause any sort of anxiety. No, I do find that owners can really overdo these because when you give them something to do, they will do it with gusto if they think it's going to help the dog. Um, and so I've had owners in the past do this like seven and eight times a day um, when they can, and that can actually make them much worse. You're doing it way too much. So I recommend only doing it one to two times a week um, at most. And some dogs, there aren't any um, departure cues that they actually key into. So it really is just the actual act of leaving. So we can't really work on that yet. And then we do what are called graduated planned departures. So this is important to keeping the um, dog under threshold at all times. So this is where we leave, but we leave for very short periods of time, making sure that the dog is always relaxed on camera. And then we come back before the dog's anxiety actually peaks. So during these graduated planned departures, we often, I recommend doing a signal of some sort that tells the dog, this is a training um, scenario. I'm not actually just leaving for work um, or to go out to dinner, we are doing like a minute departure and then we're gonna you know, bump it up to three minutes and then we're gonna bump it up to seven minutes as long as the dog is doing okay. Now, this, this is really important that this be under the supervision of either a, a trainer or um, a veterinary behaviorist who understands how to keep that dog under threshold appropriately because the owners oftentimes push way too far too fast. Um, the other nice, the other thing about graduated plan departures is that um, we can still use our departure medications as long as it's not something like a benzodiazepine that's going to block that learning. So we just want to make sure that we're using appro appropriate medications um, for the training piece too. But what never works? The biggest one is punishment. We don't ever want to punish the dog when we get home because that can heighten their arousal, that anticipatory anxiety of your return of, oh my gosh, there's pee on the floor. Now mom's going to return and I'm going to get spanked. So it heightens their anxiety and arousal um, associated with that return. 
Getting a second dog most often does not work. In fact, it has the opposite effect in that the other dog goes, well, this guy's panicking. Maybe I need to panic about, about this mom being gone too. Um, and so now you can have two dogs with separation anxiety. And the other thing is doing nothing. So if the owner's like, oh, they're just going to grow out of it. Um, they're going to get used to it. When I go back to work post COVID, that is not the case. They actually actively have to work on this. Um, so it's really important that we're screening this as clinicians. And I get this question probably 90% of the time in the very first consult is when we're talking about medication, can we ever get off of meds? Um, and that is definitely going to depend. It's going to depend on the case, the severity level, the worse it is, the more likely we are not going to ever be able to get them off of medication. It's going to depend on the dog's age and how long the separation anxiety has been going on for. If the dog is seven and has had separation anxiety all of those seven years, pretty unlikely that we're going to be able to um, minimize that. If the dog has separation anxiety at a very, very early age, like a puppy, that is ab, um, very abnormal and may make it less likely that we actually get it, um, get them off of medication in the future. Also depends on whether the owner is able to put in some of that training. So if they are unable to do the graduated plan departures, um, it's very unlikely that the dog will truly learn that being home alone is not you know, a death sentence for them. So um, if they're unable to do any of the training because they're busy people, then we may not be able to get them off of the medication. And then it's also gonna depend on the medication. So many of these patients, I'm able to wean them off their pre-departure medications once we get our daily, like our reconcile um, to a therapeutic level, but some I'm not. Um, Lincoln is my trigger stacking case that I mentioned. He, unfortunately, he's been under treatment now for about three or four years. He's on Reconcile as a daily medication. Um, and then he also takes his pre-departure meds Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, his dad, one of his dads moved, um, and that was a big recurrence in Lincoln's separation anxiety. And he ended up back on pre-departure meds at the high dose Monday through Friday um, for about three months until we were able to get that back under control. So it really is going to depend on the case, sort of where they fall out. Um, but if the owners are adamant in that they want to wean them off medication, we recommend going eight to 12 months post clinical resolution and doing sl a slow wean off one medication at a time. So, so making sure that the dog is completely well controlled otherwise, and then we do, um, do one medication at a time. And it also depends on the owner's desires. So little Charlie Champion here, he came in for a recheck when I was finishing my residency because they wanted to make sure that um, we were, you know, kind of good to go and I graduated them. And I said, hey, you know, we haven't talked about potentially weaning off uh, Charlie off of Reconcile because he was on Reconcile at the time as well. Um, and they were like, if you mention that, I am gonna report you to the to the state board. We are not getting this dog off drugs. They did not want to go back to the level of destruction that they were seeing. Um, and Charlie was very, very well controlled on his protocol. So um, I assume that Charlie has lived out the remainder of his life um, taking his meds. So in light of COVID, what should we expect? Um, when people go back to work, are we gonna see an upswing in separation anxiety? And unfortunately, I can't really answer that because of course you've heard this um, statement probably a million times, we are in unprecedented times, right? Never in our the history of veterinary behavior medicine have we ever had something like this to deal with where we are gonna see such a drastic shift for many of these pets. What is going to probably depend on is the individual resiliency of that individual animal. So just like when we all entered COVID, um, we as humans have a very have a varied level of resiliency. So some of us were like, yep, working from home, got this, this is awesome, right? And you were able to just kind of, you know, go with the flow and no, you were no worse for the wear. Some of our pets may be like that too. They may be like, yeah, peace out. I'll see you when you get home. Um, but some dogs and cats may actually not have as much resiliency and they may really start to panic um, as their owners sort of roll back um, into work. And so what can we do now to help um, really prevent um, those patients from getting separation anxiety? The first thing would be is every patient should, or every client should be go ahead and doing the bond training. So making sure that they're already doing the pre-steps um, to separation, actual separation anxiety training. 
The other thing they can do is keeping predictable schedules and routine. So, you know, many people that are working from home, they're, you know, not getting up and going to the gym like they normally would. They may sleep in much later. They may, you know, work a little bit in the morning and then work again in the evening, something like that. But that's going to be very different than the routine that they keep once they go back into the office. And so we recommend that they keep whatever that routine looks like. If they normally go to the gym at 630, get up at 630 and go for a walk without the dog. Um, they can also work on uncoupling departure cues. So they can work on if the dog, you know, is worried about the keys or the shoes being put on, they can do those a couple times a week where they don't actually then leave. And the biggest thing is actually practicing departures. So many of these patients have never been left home alone um, and they've never really had any sort of learning that, um, you know, the owners actually do leave. So once, what should be done once the owners are really back to that normal schedule um, post COVID, the first and foremost is definitely video monitoring the pet. So making sure that we are keeping an eye on um, the dog, whether or and cat, um, whether or not they're going to develop separation anxiety over the course of the first three months that owners go back to work. And then at the earliest signs of any sort of separation anxiety, they need to be seeking care as soon as possible. So making sure that we are putting out social media notices to our owners, sending out, you know, if you guys send out like quarterly newsletters, making sure that people understand that this could be a possibility and that they should be videoing their pet. Um, and what to do is to come see you to make sure that there aren't any sort of medical concerns um, that are going on. And then referral to um, either a veterinary behaviorist if you don't feel comfortable treating um, or a, um, if you feel comfortable doing like the product intervention, then um, sending them to a certified separation anxiety trainer for the training piece of things. So other resources, this is um, a great book for owners with dogs with separation anxiety by Milena DiMartini. Um, and Milena is actually the developer of the certified separation anxiety training program. So she, um, she trains trainers to become certified in um, treating separation anxiety. And then those trainers can work with clients anywhere in the world because it's all done on Zoom. So the owners will do a mission departure is what they call it, um, where the owner actually leaves the house and then the trainer watches the dog and um, determines what is the length of that departure that when should the owners come back at the first signs of any sort of anxiety, then they have the owner come back and then they give them a week's worth of practice stuff that they want them to do until the next time they do a true mission um, with the trainer. So it's a really good resource. Melina also has a, um, a client program called Mission Possible that the owners will can go and it's an you know, just an, like a webinar essentially um, that they can learn the steps to do the separation anxiety training on their own if they don't need the hands-on help. Um.